First, I just want to say it's a huge honor to be here, get my nervous jitters out of here. But uh, when Rita asked me to talk, I at first I was like, holy cow, really? I, I don't know. But then I, I, I found out the global theme this month was education. And my background to kind of you know be standing here today from point A to Z is really diverse and interesting. And there's a lot of education that has been there. So uh, today's talk, uh, I'm going to talk about sort of my formal education versus sort of the informal education I've learned sort of on the, on the ground, feet running, um, and using those different types of education to drive my success that I've you know, found today. So in short, my background, real quick, just to kind of catch you all all the speed so I don't have to spend a lot of time sharing my entire life story. Grew up on a farm, went to Purdue University, became an art teacher. After I was an art teacher, I decided to go to law school. From law school, I became a corporate recruiter, a headhunter, okay, curveball. Now, I am a full-time painter. Okay, so what about that career path really led to me? I mean, the, the, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know really how it happened, but yet I'm standing here today. So let's kind of back up just a bit. Let's go, let's go back to my days at Purdue. Why did I pick Purdue University? So um, growing up on the farm, I knew that I wasn't going to be a farmer. So I'm like, what do I want to do? hey, what, if I could pick any job in the world, what would it be? It's like, why don't I become an art teacher? I mean, that sounds fun. And so uh, I did that. I chose Purdue University. The reason I chose Purdue University uh, over the other state schools is simply it didn't have a portfolio review. I really, even though I had <laughs> a serious, even though I had a really sincere passion for art, I, I'm also a realist. Uh, I don't. I didn't think I had what it took to to be competitive, you know, at a creative level with with other creatives, and so I was like, well, why don't I just go to Purdue and I can, you know, there's no hurdles. I can just go make this happen. I can be, become an art teacher, and you know, that's what I did. Simultaneously, going through my years at Purdue, I really understood that my creative talent was a pretty big weakness in my skill set. So I had a drawing instructor there. Uh, his name is, is James Werner, and I took my it was my second year of, of Purdue, um, sort of a, an intro to drawing class with him. Uh, he happened to be a really incredible talent, incredible artist, and uh, studied at the American Academy of Art, classically trained. Uh, I really gravitated towards him because I really figured I could learn a ton from this from this guy. Well, he landed at Purdue because that was where he was from, and simultaneously, he was starting an art school uh, in Lafayette, a private art school, and he was building that out over my duration at Purdue. Well, private lessons are expensive, but I knew I had to spend time with this guy. So I was just like, well, I can do manual labor, and as he was building out this incredible studio in the loft of his beautiful Victorian home, uh, I traded drywalling, uh, manual labor uh, for, you know, sessions in the studio, private lessons. And so uh, for a period of years, I, I went to Purdue, but I also studied under James. And uh, in hindsight, you know, even at that time, I never thought I'd become a full-time painter. That just wasn't, but I knew that he was really giving me a very strong foundation in, in you know, the principles and elements of design, the fundamentals of art, and I was really, it was closing a big gap that, that really Purdue wasn't doing. And so, uh, it, it is, it's kind of crazy because now that foundation I learned from, from James is really what has 
carried my work to date. And, and if I didn't have that experience, I, don't, I really don't know if I would be here as a full-time painter. So, graduate Purdue. Oh, I think I went backwards. And I do this. I become an art teacher. I was an elementary school art teacher for three years. And very, very quickly, what I learned as a teacher is my time at Purdue, all that time sitting in the classroom, it did not prepare me for having my own classroom and managing that. I, I just, so my second week into school, and I, I mean, I have really no idea what I'm doing. I'm just kind of, I mean, that's what you do. You learn by doing. And I, I actually, I forgot to, to put the little name tag, but I know I saw one other person in the room when I was kind of looking that learns by doing. That's, that's I really, that's how I think I learn by doing. And, uh, my second week into class, I, we have an art classroom, so it's always messy, clean up. I'm trying to figure out, how do I even manage this process of getting my students to clean up efficiently? Well, at the time, I thought, giant sponges for my table. That's what I need. I need these giant sponges. We get it done real fast, you know, clean up these tables. Well, there ends up being a fight over one of these sponges. It escalates to the point one kid actually hits the other kid in the eye. And this is my second week into doing this. The kid that gets hit, he's wearing glasses. His glasses break, cut his face. Face, they bleed. <laughs> Blood everywhere. And I'm just like, man, you know, I'm shell-shocked. I, I have no idea what to do. No amount of time at Purdue prepares you for that moment where you're like, oh, crap. I... So, you know, you just do what you're, you're like, okay, I guess I have to react. I have to do something. So um, I sent the kid bleeding with another student I trusted to the nurse. And then I called the office and, and had him come, you know, get the, the discipline, you know, the kid. that. And then I was like, man. So I guess uh, my, my lesson there was, uh, let me get here. You know, the, the formal education can really only prepare you for so much. You know, it really takes being in the environment where you're really going to learn. And so uh, I, I guess, yeah, so that's formal education really, uh, you know, it, ju it just took me so far. So I'm going into my third year teaching. And if people out there have friends who are teachers, there's probably teachers in this room. Uh, as a teacher, the more experience you get, and, and it's unfortunate the system operates like this, but uh, at least in our state, the less marketable you become. So I knew that the corporation I, I was at was probably not the place I was going to be for the duration. And I was, I was very open-minded going into that third year. If I'm going to make a change and if I'm going to move, I'm probably going to have to do it sooner than later. And whether that was I was going to go be home closer to my family, you know, maybe move closer to downtown Indianapolis, I don't know. So I went into that year very open-minded. Well, my little brother who's sitting in the audience he calls me up during that first semester, and he's like, hey, dude, I'm graduating undergrad. I'm going to go to law school. And I'm like, hmm, law school. Interesting. Sure. Why not? So we applied to, uh, I think, 11 different schools all over the Midwest. Uh, really, our only, we just wanted to go together. I mean, that was kind of the point of doing it. Um, got into two schools together, and uh, we ended up choosing Valparaiso University, which is just about an hour from where we grew up, and that's where we went. So uh, I went to law school. So law school, real quick, here's a... <laughs> this, this fa we're going to fast forward just a minute for this photo. Um, th this was uh, right after my first year, I had my first solo gallery exhibit, and uh, I got that show... Um, I walked into the gallery, kind of a cold call, had paintings in my hand, because there's no, you just don't know what you're doing at first. You're just like, I have paintings, can I put them in your gallery? Um, well, she's like, actually, I had an artist just back out for my June show, and I think that was about four weeks out. Can you fill the gallery for a solo exhibit? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, <laughs> then I'm like, holy cow, how am I going to do this? So, you know, you just commit and then do. You know, you commit and then figure it out. And uh, I took 50 pieces to that show, made those 50 pieces, and I had work in progress before that, uh, but I, we, we sold almost the entire show, and that was the moment where I was like, man, I, I think maybe I have something here. So, 
law school, kind of to go back to the, I'm coming in as a non-traditional student, you know, and I, I really, um, I, I'd like to think that I'm humble. I'd like to think that I'm modest. Uh, I do think I have a certain level of ego, um, but I, I, I went into this very confident and maybe overly confident um, to the point where, you know, I didn't have a scholarship at first. I'm like, going to go in. I'm going to put my head to the ground because there's, there's really one goal. You want to become, you know, really successful and become the best that you could possibly be. And, you know, I'm not giving up a great career to go do this to, you know, half-ass it. So I was like, well, let's go put this. So my brother and I, we were very similar. We're, we're going to go. We did the study groups. I feel like that first semester we did everything right. We were really focused. Uh, studying, living in the library, doing everything you're supposed to be doing, and getting grades back that first semester had to be one of the most humbling experiences of my life. And I think I realized at that moment, you know, law school is full of people just like me. (laughs) You know, motivated, driven, successful. They all had great grades. And so not everyone in this big group who always got great grades can now get great grades. So that was a real big, I had never applied myself so much to a goal and failed so hard. And that was, it was humbling to say the least. So you know what I did? I ponied up second semester. I'm like, we're going to figure this out. Nate and I, we worked harder. We lived in the library. And after second semester, my grades got marginally better. (laughs) So then I'm also a realist. And I feel very thankful that I had my experience um, teaching and kind of understanding Purdue only prepared me for so much. It really took teaching. So I'm like, you know what? What I really need to actually do is just go get real-world experience and learn how to practice law because I'm going to learn more by doing than I am by sitting in the classroom. And I guess my attitude quickly became, I bet I can do almost nothing because what, what happens in law school, they grade on a curve. So here I am. I'm in the middle of this curve you know, and I'm trying like crazy. Well, the thing is, this curve, it happens to rake in the entire back end. So I'm like, I bet I can do almost nothing and live in the courtroom, live at the law firm, and really learn how to practice law. So that's what I did. Um, I stopped trying. I stopped reading as much my second year. I mean, that's just true. That's really what happened. And I focused on learning how to actually practice law. And so at that point, from I, I got my uh, first real job, Um, at the first semester of my second year of law school, and from that point forward, I clerked 20 hours a week all the way until I graduated, and I saw cases, and I was was doing, actually, I was doing debt collection, and it was, oh, it was awful, Um, really, really sad, but, you know, I worked cases where, you know, I'm drafting the complaint from the very, very beginning, and I worked there long enough to where I was, the first time I ever froze somebody's bank accounts, they were in our office that day, but it took, you know, writing a check to, to settle their debt. And, and it, but it took, you know, years to get, or, you know, a year to get to that point. And, you know, but I guess I had worked that case all the way through. So, you know, I'm, I'm clerking 20 hours a week, uh, really learning how to become a lawyer. And by the time I get to my 3L year, and this is, this is also true, I didn't even buy books for my classes. Um, I, I really didn't. Uh, I, I, I really think that, you know, there, there's, anyways, I mean, there's, there's, there's ways to get through things and, and, and you know, drive success, but thankfully, uh, I, I was smart enough and had enough so- foresight since I didn't care about my GPA anymore. Um, I'm the only person I know at my law school that took every single class the school offered that was also on the Indiana State Bar Exam. So I took GPA busters, like Indiana Constitutional Law, Admin Law, UCC. I mean, this is the most mundane, boring stuff you could ever possibly sit through. But I also, even though I didn't buy books, I had great attendance. I would sit in class. I would pay attention. I had, I had the, the uh, outlines. So, you know, I'm in class learning, but I'm not wasting my time out of class. I'm actually, when I'm out of, out of class, I'm, you know, focused on learning how to, you know, be the best lawyer that I can possibly be. So, simultaneously, you know, I didn't go to law school to think that, hey, I'm going to become a professional artist. You know, I, that, that wasn't the end game there. So, uh, but, but also, I, you know, being a teacher, no debt, single, 
you know, a $30,000 salary is, is great money, you know? I mean, I, I, I was spending, I was traveling, I was doing everything I wanted to do. Going to law school, not getting scholarships, living off student loans. I mean, you have to have secondary sources of incomes just to survive. And so one of my solutions, I was, you know, I was just like, hey, I have this skill. Why don't I try to start selling paintings? And so that's what I did. So right here, this was October, my 1L year. Um, and, and this was more just kind of a, a release. I created these seven paintings, and <clears throat> I sold every one of them pretty quick for 100 bucks. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey, I just made 700 bucks in a week and a half. This isn't so bad. And, and then I happened to be surrounded by business-minded people who just, some of them got their MBAs. And this is, you know, 2008. They're like, there's this thing called advertising on the internet, targeted advertising, paid ads. You know, so these people consulted me, and they helped me build a business. In selling, and in 2008, I sold over 200 original paintings and reproductions all over, not just our country, but all over the world. And at that point, I still had never had a gallery show, never put my, my work in galleries. I was doing this because I needed to pay bills and I needed to make money, and this was, you know, a pretty quick solution to do that. And it was fun. You know, it was simply fun. But, yeah, so part of my entrepreneurial spirit when I was at Valpo um, one of the things I would do to help build brand awareness, because that's something that we all kind of think about, is uh, at first I would do these anonymous white, super elaborate whiteboard drawings, and I never signed them, never was like justinvining.com or anything like that. Um, I would just do them, leave them. And uh, I started doing that my last semester of my 1L year, and the last one I left, when we went back in the fall, it was still in the library. And this is on a whiteboard. I mean, anybody can erase this. And that, to me, I was like, this is interesting. So I erased it and did another. And there was always, always, until we graduated law school, there was always a whiteboard drawing. And there was only two times it was ever messed up. One time, somebody drew this awesome robot in it. And that's not messing it up. That's improving. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> then there, there was a, another time that somebody had erased it. But other than that, uh, to me, it was very interesting. You have this ephemeral drawing that anybody could do anything with, and they respected it. And, and you know, it, it's crazy because I meet people from Valparaiso now, and I just have to say, I was the whiteboard drawing guy. And they're like, oh, they knew who I am. So I did these whiteboard drawings. Here's another. But I also, in the entrepreneurial spirit, <laughs> on a good Friday, I could make 60 bucks. I had three classes. I would doodle in my book in every class, and I would sell them for $20 a piece after class. Now all of a sudden, I have beer money for the weekend. <laughs> Got one more little doodle. Okay, so law school. Again, formal education, it really only prepared me for so much. I really, it, it took real-world experience to sort of take my you know, take it to the next level. So I'm graduating law school, and this is the plan. My, my business has grown to a point where it's pretty sustainable. I'm making predictable income and, I, and, and real income at that. Uh, so the plan was my brother and I, we were just going to open a law firm together where we were from, downtown Warsaw, and about, I mean, it really was halfway through our third year where it's, this, is, this can really happen. And so that's what we did. That, that last year of law school, the last half, we positioned ourselves to open a firm, a law firm in downtown Warsaw, and we rented a storefront a half block from the courthouse, and through my, our income, we, we could cover the overhead. So at that point, the plan was he was going to build the, the law business, I was going to continue to paint, um, you know, and that, we're just going to see what happens, you know, we'll just go. Well, about, I don't know, I can't remember what the timeline was, probably a week or so before we were to open the door, uh, I get a call of the blue. Long story short, I get asked to interview for a job at a corporate recruiting firm. Uh, I know the firm. I know the owner of the firm. Uh, I know the reputation. They are, 
the best of the best at what they do. I mean, they're the, the cream of their crop. Um, they, they, they really are extremely successful. And, uh, you know, it's probably one of the only truly money-motivated decisions that I, I really have made. I was like, you know what? Let's go do this. And so I came back to Indy and became a corporate recruiter. Well, this actually quickly became the best education that I possibly could have had to put me in the position where I am at today. And I, I, I really, it's crazy. And in going into this, I didn't see it as a learning opportunity. I, I saw it as a money-making opportunity, and that's, you know, what I did. But people at the top of their game, businesses, I, I, the account I was on, I was working on the Red Bull account. Red Bull, they can work with anybody. So if they're choosing to work with you, you know you're dang good. Um, and Red Bull has pretty much some of the highest standards for, um, you know, I was on this, I was recruiting sales roles, and their salespeople, they want the best of the best of the best. Well, I'm on the phone every single day talking to people in sales. Well, people in sales, and having talked to hundreds of them at this point, you can always tell the good ones from the great ones. The great ones they understand how they drive their business from behind the scenes. The good ones, they BS you. They're just, ah, bah, 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 you know, just talking. The great ones, they're metric driven. They really understand the data that drives their business. And mirrored the agency, the, the, the company I was working for, they were a metric driven business. And what I mean by that is we had sales meetings every Monday. And every Monday, um, we would bring our hot sheets. This hot sheet was really... Um, it was all the data that drove the business. And when I say data that drove the business, I mean, I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on, on stuff, but they really understand where their money comes from. Everything down to, I knew, they knew every time we picked up the phone to dial, it was $50 for the company. I mean, not literally, but like that was every time you, that's the, you know, the average. So they, they really understand the metrics. So <clears throat> when I was a, a recruiter, after seven months being there, my business was tanking, I was not painting, and I, I, I realized quickly that the balance I was able to strike in law school, you know, driving a business, clerking, you know, all that stuff, it was not real in the real world. I couldn't do it. And so I had to make a choice. You know, what's it going to be? Am I going to continue with this job or am I going to, uh, you know, pursue my dream? And so I quit on a whim, no plan. I'm just like, screw it, let's go do this. And so that's what I did. Well, when I, I quit, I wasn't thinking about this hot sheet and data, and I wasn't thinking about that stuff. I'm thinking about painting. Let's go make some paintings and sell them. And so, you know, at first, that's what I did. So the first six months, I hit the, I hit the ground running. I hit the ground running hard, and I was just trying to go as fast and as hard as I, as I could. And so when New Year's came, 2012, I started, being, I started really thinking about the business side of my business and, and really starting to understand that more. So one of the things I did at the very beginning of 2012 is I, I looked at the, the hot sheet that I was using at the firm, and I was just like, how can I use this to help drive my business? And, and, and is this something I can even use? Well, I'll tell you this. I have used that hot sheet for three years now, and it has been the most important tool in my business tool bag. Because and I'll, I'll give you a glimpse of my hot sheet. I got it up here. So it's, it's nothing fancy. It is an Excel spreadsheet, primitive at best. But the data inside this, and I have tabs and tabs of tabs, you know, 2012 sales history, 2013 sales history, 2014. So like right now, I know I've sold 40% less pieces in 2014 over 2013. But actually, my income is up 35%. My average Time to sell a piece this year is 67 days. So, and last year it was 47. So I'm actually I'm selling pieces slower than I I, I used to, but I, I understand that you know I'm making more per piece. My average price per square inch right now is $1.26 a square inch. Last year it was 74 cents. So I have almost doubled the value of my work in 12 months. Okay, so what? Okay, I know all that stuff. Awesome. How can I use that to drive business forward? Well, I, I use it in several different ways. The impacts of the hot sheet. First is understanding value, negotiating. There's two, two things I've negotiated very recently. Uh, 
that you know, understanding that I'm tracking at a dollar twenty six a square inch. So I guess I sent a quote out a year and a half ago for a project, a big project. And in that year and a half, obviously my value has doubled. Well, in readjusting and renegotiating sort of the final contract, I was able to increase that contract by 87%. But the thing was, is being very transparent about my numbers, about understanding, it's what really sold it. You know, I, and his feedback to me was, had you pulled that number out of nowhere and just said, this is what I'm worth, I would have said no. But he's like, the fact that you grounded it in real sales data and real, because I, I showed him, I showed the math. I was like, this is how I'm getting this number. And he's like, that's done, sold. The other, forecasting. So right now, I know I have eight pieces in inventory. I know approximately how much I'm going to sell each one of those pieces. I know how many days they've been in inventory. And based upon my, my sales history, 67 days, I can fairly accurately forecast how much income I should make in December and how much income I should make in January. So now all of a sudden, I know I can, I can really understand, okay, if I want to make X amount of dollars, I can look at the math. I need to create X amount of pieces this month. Lead generation, this is, this is one of the most valuable tools in this hot sheet that, that was not foreseeable at the time, but I don't wish and hope for sales. I mean, you, you can't be a full-time painter and just paint something and hope it goes on the wall. I proactively go out and get it. One of the ways I go out and get it is by keeping track of everybody that's ever been interested in my work. If you have sent me an email being like, hey, I am interested in a color acrylic painting, I got a budget of X, I put that in my hot sheet. So I have hot leads and I have cold leads. So if, it, let's say after six months-ish, we have not followed up and closed the deal, I put you in the cold leads. But all of a sudden, I have years of cold leads. So let's say I paint a Boston skyline. I know there's three people on my hot sheet that are interested in Boston skylines. You know the first three people I'm going to go call? Those people. And then metric-based selling. So uh, we, a lot of times, we, and I'm very, very guilty of doing this, but I think early career artists, a lot of times they'll put prices on their piece and they don't necessarily understand how they get there. They're like, why did I price this? And if you were to ask them, why did I price this piece this way? They're just, they're not going to tell you a great answer. You know, me, when I'm pricing my January show, I know how to price it to sell. I know how to price it to sit. I know, I, in the, way, the reason I know how to do that is because I have, I have history of, I, I can look at the history and I know you know, if the average, the last 10 pieces I sold color acrylic when they are priced at X, I sold them in 30 days. You know, 10% higher, all of a sudden I'm selling them 84. You know, it, so, so it gives me a lot of insight into how and where I make my money. Okay, in closing. So what, what I've really learned is a lot of the educational opportunities, it's not necessarily sitting in the classroom like you'd think. It's, you know, events like this. It's, uh, you know, just you never know. I mean, I never would have guessed that being a corporate recruiter would have helped me drive my business forward. That just wasn't a thing that, that I was thinking. So uh, when looking at continuing education, whether formal or informal, you know, I asked myself, it's what value can be extracted from this? You know, what value can I get? How can I use the information to improve as a person? And then... You know, how can I use this new information to drive my business forward? That's it. <laughs> Questions? How do you price your work? I mean, it sounds like you're using like a market-based pricing model. How do you do that, but also strike the balance between that and the salary that you want to make? That's a great question. So the, the, the salary that I want, I mean, it, it really comes down to number of pieces. And then, it, and then it's creating that number of piecing, pieces in an uncompromising way. So it's, it's understanding that even though if I, I create a piece in, in only two hours, it's every bit as you know, successful and I have you know, every, as much energy in that piece as one that takes like, let's say, 20 or 30 but, I mean, it really, it, that's, that's where it comes down to is, is number of pieces. And then understanding, okay, I can't make 90. Because I know in um, 2012, I sold 90 pieces. 2013, I, I sold 93. But those 93 were not all $200 pieces. So it's striking a balance between, you know, some of the higher-end pieces that, you know, you could sell. But it's also, 
you know, let's say I'm, I'm putting $2,200 on a piece versus $200, um, that piece has to have so much difference. Every bit of look and feel of that more expensive, everything from the, the craftsmanship to the frame to everything, I mean, it's really got to sell it. So, I mean, just, I don't know if that really answered your question, but, yeah. But any others? Come on, there's got to be questions. Yeah. Where do you find inspiration? Where do I find inspiration? So my, my biggest inspiration is, is growing up on the farm. And, and in a very literal way, a lot of, like my January show, a lot of the inspiration has come directly from farms right outside of Indianapolis. And what I do is I'll go out, take drives, um, and then I, I shoot a lot of photographs of the work, and I bring those photos back into my studio and make sketches. Yeah. yeah. Yes? What sort of people do you collaborate with to make your business so, man, collaborating, D yes. I collab, uh, great question. So, um, I, even um, Tia, sh um, I did a collaborative show um, in Tia's uh, at New Day last year um, with a, a local photographer, and uh, he does high speed photography, blowing up stuff. And so, I painted all this stuff on glass objects, went to his studio, and, and, and blew all, all my art, which was really interesting. But, um, you know, I, I collaborate with all different types of people to create art, but I also collaborate with people to take lessons. So um, two people that I've collaborated, or I guess almost just taken lessons from this year to, to really learn from, have both been uh, realists. So I'm not a realist. My style is not realism. But the thing is, is, is learning from people that are, you know, great at their craft. So like Terry Armstrong is somebody I spent two days with up in northern Indiana this year. Um, even though I never really want to paint like him, he has so much to teach me and so much to learn. Um, and so, you know, I just go and learn from him. And then um, there's another artist here in Indianapolis that does realism and oil painting. And I, I am not an oil painter. It's really hard to paint with oils. But, um, you know, took a lesson with her and, and really start trying to learn the, the foundation. So I guess the people I gravitate towards um, on the art side are people I really think I can learn and, and improve from. The business side, I gravitate towards really successful people. And, and, and I think uh, some of my mentors have, and some of my biggest behind the scenes supporters have been the people I worked with at the, the recruiting firm. And, and learning from and working with people who really understand how to drive successful businesses, I mean, that information rubs off. So, good question. Yeah. How has your marketing changed from 2008 to now. Wow, that's a great question. I feel like you know, yeah, that's, okay. So, um, I started my business selling on the internet, and I was doing paid advertising specifically on Facebook, and the early days in Facebook, you could, you could pay, pay per click, I mean, 10 cents a click. I mean, it was pennies, and I, I was spending, uh, it probably was, it was 2009, every day in 2009, I spent $5 on Facebook, um, every single day. And the thing was that $5 went a long ways. And, and that's why I have a map in my studio. Uh, and if anybody wants to go up and check it out in a, in a bit, my studio, um, I have paintings all over our country, and that's from that early advertising. So I started building my business through the Internet. And what I quickly realized was, okay, so I, I really drove business to the Internet until 2012. And even when I was in Indianapolis, I was kind of flying under the radar, selling through the Internet. Um, Facebook was my biggest lead generation. Well, when EdgeRank, the, the algorithm, changed in September of 2012, I realized I had put all my eggs in one basket, and I put them in the Facebook basket. And that, it was, it was a mistake. You know, I, I, I didn't realize that Facebook in one day could... You know, because I, I really do, I have a modest following there, uh, like 12,000 people, and uh, leveraging that number to sell an affordable product that is high quality, it was an extremely powerful tool to drive sales. Well, when EdgeRank changed and all of a sudden my views go, and I, I had ex Excel spreadsheets of the data showing how it impacted my, my business because I was so livid. I took it so personally that Facebook would change because you know, I had invested so much time, energy, and money into building that tool for them to, in one day, change it. I was livid. It, it really, so, so then I, I had to refocus, and that's when everything changed to becoming the Indianapolis guy. 
And, and because I, my biggest collectors at that time were not here. They were in Florida. They were in Texas. They were in California. They were people I have still never met to this day, but still buy my work. And I really, I, I realized quickly I have to build a local following here, and I have to build credibility here because, you know, I, I was living and working out a broader bowl, but my neighbors, they had no idea that there was a living, working artist, you know, two doors down. So, so it's really changed to become local-focused, and I really, it, a lot of ways, it, it hasn't really changed. I, I really want to drive business as far as I can in the city and then go out again and, and, and build a real relationships with real people, collectors that I can shake their hands, and then, you know, someday I'll, I'll, I'll branch out, but I'll do it in a different way, and I probably won't drive my business through the internet as much anymore. So, good question. Yeah. How do you, so obviously as your price points have changed, you have collectors that had their pieces that when they were making more affordable in their price range. As that has gone up, how do you balance uh, creating pieces for your collectors in a new price range that might be out of the price range to find new followers and new people as that price point has changed? Has it, has it changed your collectors, so to speak? Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of the collectors that were buying at a lower price point have not bought recently. And having the higher price points has, really has changed my collector base. And I mean, what I've found is it's been, it, it really, especially my, my, I, my premium pieces, the $1,000 pieces or more, that I think I, I, the number that I've sold this year is to just a small handful of people. So my premium collectors, they come back and they come back for more. So it hasn't been a very, it's, it's not like I'm selling them randomly to a lot of people. It's usually a focus, but those people were not the early adopters. They weren't the ones that were, were in the game early. They've, they're kind of a new generation of collectors. So, yeah. Do you ever think about going back to the classroom, and do you think your kind of more calculated approach now than what you had before would change how you would do teaching again? You know, I, I, I have not thought about going back to the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really do think it would change. I, I am a different person now than I was then. And, and part of it, I just know new information, and I think differently than I did then. I, I think... You know, my, my teaching style, uh, my personality, I don't think has necessarily changed that much, but, but I think the way that I teach certainly would change. Yeah. Do you have a personal favorite project or partnership, that just one that you're especially proud of? Um, personal relationship, okay. Uh, yeah, you know, okay, yeah, I do. And, and so... One of the things that I've been lucky enough behind the scenes to do is build relationships with art supply companies. And one of the art supply companies that I work with uh, is a handmade paper. It's kind of like the, the Lamborghini of fine art papers. And I have built a really close relationship with them uh, to the point where I can go to their mill and I'm, I'm making the paper. But last year as a gift, uh, they allowed me, they actually they took my logo, my, my logo for all my branding, and they, they had it uh, uh, CNC'd in aluminum, and then we sewed that logo into the paper mold. And so now I, I, the watercolor papers that I'm painting on, I made at the mill, but then they're branded just in binding through a watermark. So that, that partnership is, is pretty kick-ass. I like it. <laughs> but, um, one more question? Okay, yeah. Do you ever get stuck in a so like, yeah, so I do get stuck. Not as much anymore as I, as I used to, but one of the ways where I quickly um, find inspiration, and there's going to be a piece uh, in my January. So I, just a, a quick plug. Uh, I, I have the main gallery here at the Harrison Center solo exhibit January 1st Friday, so it's January 2nd. One of the pieces in the show is, is this style. So sometimes when I get stuck, I look at my inspiration or the, the, the artists that inspire me. So like... Um, Edward Hopper, Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, and I'll take pieces of theirs and I'll sort of pay tribute to the composition, the compositional elements, and I'll recreate it entirely in my style. So there's, there's, a, there's a piece going to be in the show that uh, is very directly influenced by an American artist named Andrew Wyeth. 
his peace and my peace, night and day difference. And if I didn't tell you that, you probably never, ever would have noticed. But um, when I get in a creative rut and I'm just looking for ideas pretty quick, that's a place I go to turn to. Because all of a sudden, you're drawing and you're not thinking anymore and you're executing. Because, I mean, that, let's face it, sometimes you do get in a creative rut and you just have to keep the wheels going. So that's one of the ways I do it. Thank you.